So as part of our ongoing safety journey, each year we come up with something that helps us to continue our focus on safety. So the concept of to stop, to think, to talk before we act, it's just to ensure that before we move out with actions, that we are taking that time to really look at the potential um, concerns, to look at and understand the hazards, the potential threats. What can we do to mitigate those threats down to an acceptable level? And so that all of us are comfortable with moving forward. I know that we deal with a lot of urgent work, a lot of emergency work, and we have a tendency to get in a hurry. It's a lot easier to take that shortcut. It's a lot easier to be able to justify, our work is so important. There's so much urgency around it. I gotta get to it, I gotta get after it. Well, I can tell you, I understand that. But this concept helps us to really pause and really think through what we're going to do before we act. And it's so important for us to understand this is just not about our emergency work. This is not just about our emergency response to fires or the work that our law enforcement officers do. I'll tell you, this concept works for all of us, for everything that we do throughout the day. And I don't care if you work in an office, that's where you go to work every day, or if you're fortunate enough to be out in the field every day. This concept helps all of us. So I don't want anyone to ever feel there's, there's any reason to hesitate or feel uncomfortable about having these discussions. It's what I'd like to ask you to do and to think about this as you go about your work. Let's listen to several leaders' thoughts on stop, think, and talk before acting. Then you will hear three true stories about when an employee felt pressure to get the work done, but also had safety concerns. These stories will give you an opportunity to discuss how you could use stop, think, and talk before acting in similar situations. I would suggest that, that um, the safety is a core value that we have that's above and beyond. Priorities are something that change from year to year um, and can change even within the year. And so those things are something we need to adjust, but safety is at an entirely different level. It's an umbrella over everything that we do. Yeah, we ask our employees to take on tasks every day that have a level of risk. I can't be with every employee to help them determine what's right and what's wrong but I can offer the opportunity for an employee to have a conversation, whether it, it could be with me, it could be with a coworker, to stop and come up with a good plan so that they make it home. Because we do dangerous things, whether we're, whether we're on fire or working out in, on a timber crew or in a recreation, as a recreation guard, what we do has danger. And, and we owe it to our employees to be able to offer them the license to have a conversation about what they're taking on, why they're doing it, and whether or not there are options to, to getting the work done. My responsibility and responsibility, I believe, of line officers is to assure that, again, we provide a consistent, open forum for that conversation to happen. I, I think it's imperative that you, you have the trust. The stage is set long before the conversation occurs in that, you know, those relationships and things you have, you need to make sure that you, you work on that all the time so that when it does matter, when you need to have those tough conversations, people feel comfortable approaching you. Um, you can't wait for those folks to come and talk to you. Um, you have to you have to initiate that. You can't expect a GS3 or 4, a college student that is going to come into the district ranger's office or whatever to talk to them. You have to go out and talk to them. Well, from the district level, I think it is almost a daily conversation with your staff um, and checking in, you know, making sure that they have the opportunity to provide feedback on that front end and then checking in um, weekly sometimes, sometimes daily. Because some staff are really good about coming forward and being like, hey, this is, this is too much of a stress. This is starting to wear me down starting to take more risks, I'm feeling more tired on the road, whatever. 
and then others just really aren't. So I think the onus is on us to make sure we're keeping an eye on our people and enabling that conversation. You want to be somebody that they can come in and, and they can talk to about something that's tough uh, without having somebody blow up at them or, or anything. And so you, you, you need to be that, that cool head in the room every time uh, without exception. And, and you, you, you need to be able to provide them that safe place to talk. You got to be willing to hear it um, and, and do something constructive with it when you get it. Um, the best way to show folks that their feedback's valuable is to show some action on it when it's necessary, um, show that we heard them and we're adjusting things. We're in an environment that um, it does not stay the same. And whether we're working with animals or whether we're working with the traditional tools or on a fire, we have to re-engage our minds to consider that changing environment and how we're being exposed and whether we're managing that exposure because we can't expect anyone else to be doing it for us. You got to trust yourself that what you're feeling is real and that you're willing to speak up. Well, certainly if there's concerns that involve the here and now, it needs to be here and now. It doesn't need to be later in a report or something. It needs to be a dialogue so that we can get to, to the further depth of what the concerns are. But it, but it can't just come at it as concerns. What other recommendations are there? Are there other options or alternatives, a different path to take? If you're just struggling, that early communication and like let us work through that together, maybe identify some potential areas to follow up on. That You don't have to have everything lined up necessarily before you come in. It's really helpful if you can, but if the, don't let that be something that stops you. And I, I would hope that um, if there are people that are out in the national forest systems that or, or within the Forest Service that don't feel like they have the ability to have those conversations, that they reach out to their peers, or they reach out to people who they can you know, count on as mentors or coaches. And uh, that's why it's important for me to make sure that we're acknowledging that there are difficulties and there are no guarantees, but the fact of the matter is that you have some choices that you can make that help increase the likelihood that you're gonna come home from a 10 day hitch, or you're gonna come home from a fire assignment, or you're gonna come home every day. We had a timber project with a sale of close to 20 million board feet. We had to complete it by August so the forest could advertise, sell, and award it by the end of the fiscal year. The sale was very important for our forest timber targets for that year. It would either make or break our forest meeting its targets. We needed to complete cruising and marking. The conditions in the area were nasty heavy blowdown with a thick underbrush. It was a rainy spring and so we were dealing with waist to chest level high blowdown and everything was wet. We were also in grizzly bear country and the conditions made visibility poor. When the district gave me the project, I told them I couldn't do it with the resources I had. I only had five people on the district to work on the project and three of them couldn't start until June. The marking crew foreman and I began working on the project by ourselves in March. The force pulled extra resources from other districts to assist and offered six to eight more people to help. We made the final push in June with the five people from our district and the extra help from the other districts. Progress was slow on the project given the conditions. We worked overtime, putting in five days a week, 10 hours a day to accomplish the work. As the deadline approached for us to finish, sometime in July, the vegetation staff officer for the forest began calling weekly to check on our progress. I kept telling him, it will get done when it gets done. He would say, okay, but it's got to get done. During our first or second conversation, he said to me, this is important to the region and forest. The chief of the Forest Service even knows about this sale because it's so important to our forest targets. 
I felt a lot of pressure to get this project done. There definitely were no vacations. The sale prep forester was able to complete this project, and this is how his stop, think, talk, before acting conversation went with the vegetation officer. I was honest. I explained to him we can only do what we can do, and we are not going to injure ourselves to do more. Things take time, and we aren't just sitting. We're working hard and showing progress. I just kept telling him that it was gonna take this amount of time and that it would get done when it gets done. The vegetation staff officer did push me, but then he realized he wasn't going to intimidate me. I did keep these conversations and the pressure away from my crew. I didn't want them pushing themselves. This situation occurred on an active Type 1 wildfire in the West. On Division Zulu, the fire burned dirty or incompletely along the road all night. The division intended to conduct a burnout operation to clean it up. The hillside road had only one way in and one way out. The division identified the road as an escape route. Several firefighters were down the road prepping for the burnout operation. A felling boss and two contract fallers were assigned to clear snags along the road for crews to pass. The experienced fallers tried to cut a snag, actively burning from the base all the way to the top. They made an undercut into the tree. While inserting a wedge into the back cut, the snag sat back. At the same time, the tree and the ground started to burn more actively at the base. The saw team left the tree and decided to wait for the snag to fall on its own. They halted all road traffic, including crews to help with the burn, knowing the snag would come down at any time. Closing that section of road and waiting for the snag to fall brought operations to a standstill. After a while, other overhead arrived on scene. They were irritated the road was closed and no progress was being made on the day's objectives. They wanted the snag down so crews could get back to work. They wanted another saw team to try and hit the snag with another tree, a large, live ponderosa pine. Experienced firefighters observing the situation did not feel comfortable being under the snag or even near the snag. One firefighter on scene observed, our value system is that we can't stop and wait. We just can't sit there. Sitting there implies that we're doing nothing. The saw team tried to hit the snag with the ponderosa pine. The tree missed the snag and fell across the road, blocking the escape route. The saw team then bucked the ponderosa pine to clear the road, even though the snag was still standing.
Things moving! Water! Water! Whoever's in charge of that hose leg. Upon reflection about this situation, several firefighters on scene commented that the hazard was identified and a plan was put in place. The first SAW team disengaged and decided to wait for the snag to fall. But someone with more power came in and changed the plan, resulting in another SAW team re-engaging. The overhead added a sense of urgency and forced another plan. However, stopping gives you decision space or time for discussion. It's okay to disengage and wait. Sometimes waiting is the safest alternative. As a crew member of a cadastral or landline survey team in Alaska, my boss demanded that I take a skiff to one of our island work sites. The weather forecast called for what we refer to in southeast Alaska as a southeaster storm. These storms come out of the southeast and bring high winds of 25 to 30 knots or more. They are nothing to mess with in any watercraft much less a 13-foot Boston whaler. This situation surpassed established go-no-go no go thresholds. I told my boss that it wasn't safe. He said, I don't care, you're in protected water, inside waters, you need to go and get this work done. After a long argument, my boss finally accused me of being insubordinate, leaving me no choice but to go. The ride to the job site was uneventful, as our crew had a following sea, a wind and swell at our backs. But the ride home was much different. The sea was choppy, and we caught a wind gust that almost flipped the skiff over. We should never have been out there. This story is from a number of years ago, and I think the culture on my unit has changed since then. This kind of story might have a different outcome today. I believe the learning culture allows people to be more comfortable about refusing risky assignments and about not being judged for doing so. People seem to be more aware that they have latitude to discuss assignments and to push back when a supervisor applies pressure, but it doesn't mean these kind of situations aren't still happening in the Forest Service today. So now I'd like to ask you to think about how this concept of stop, think, talk before we act, how it's helped you, how you can apply it to your work, how you can apply it even to your life. You are making a difference and you have my appreciation for that.